Hello, National University Academy students and National University Virtual High School students. Uh, studying for your AP U.S. History Unit 6 um, content, uh, going, getting ready for those uh, discussions and quizzes, and preparing for your assessments. Um, we've done two lectures now uh, for Unit 6, 10-minute um, reviews, and this is the last of the three. Um, we're discussing chapters thir uh, 12 and 13. We've gone over everything from the Second Great Awakening and revi uh, religious revivals of the 1830s and 40s up through um, Mexican-American War. And now we are uh, taking a second quick look at um, John Tyler. And I just was explaining that he was an accidental pre president profoundly out of sympathy with the rest of his party, that he became president when uh, uh, Henry Harrison died um, after a very short time in office uh, and that Tyler's uh, principal project was to the annexation of Texas. He was a states rights pro-slavery uh, candidate who um, again was the accidental president because of Harrison's death. Um, for the Texas Revolution San Jacinto proved to be uh, the decisive battle of the war due to the capture of Santa Ana and the Texan army. Uh, you can look at page uh, 366 for that. Over 630 Mexicans were killed uh, that day in San Jacinto and only a handful of American soldiers died. Um, and looking at uh, your textbooks, review page uh, 375, you're getting into now the United States has won the war against Mexico and it has uh, attained the great harbors of in California it was it was um, uh, desiring uh, out of the deal and uh, San Francisco and San Diego principally uh, and historian uh, Frederick Merck explains why the hesitation by the United States um, in incorporating all of Mexico um, at the time of the Gadsden Purchase um, had more to do with a particular combination of racism and colonialism. Um, you'll note that uh, the United States didn't want to end up with a India-like, uh, you know, British and India-like situation where they had a colonial um, uh, administration governing a people that they would be hard to democratize or incorporate. And there was all these um, essays written at the time and, and editorials and um, blurbs in the paper about the mongrel um, peoples of Mexico who won't be able to be um, incorporated into our into the United States so uh, there was this you know racist these racist attitudes and colonial fears um, and you can review that on page 375 the two transformative economy boosting achievements of the 1840s were the railroads and canals, and so much is done at this time for advancements, but the railroads and canals are going to do so much to change the nation. You can view this on page 376, the Erie Canal, what an immense project that was, but you also have great innovations around this time. John Deere's steel plow, invented in 1837, and then mass produced in the 1850s. You have the mecha uh, mechanical reaper, you have uh, Eli Whitney's earlier, Eli Whitney's cotton gin, uh, gin short for engine. Um, and um, as I mentioned earlier with the Irish immigrants coming over um, you have this new working class and we talked about the German immigrants and why they came um, if you want to note that the new working class um, page 384 um, the, the, the treaty that um, brought Mexico and California to the United States um, after the Mexican-American War was the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. I had already mentioned that. And then uh, Secretary of State Daniel Webster finalized the agreement with the British resolving the dispute, disputed boundary line between Maine and the Canadian province of New Brunswick. And this was when he signed the Webster-Ashburton Treaty. And you'll want to review that on page 363. Uh, what I did not do to any degree here is go over with you uh, some of the great inventions and innovations of the time. I'm just going to take a second to do that. 
it's not um, something crucial for the exam. I'm not going to ask a lot of questions about this um, in a sort of pop quiz manner, but I do want to review it with you because this was a time when, uh, if you know your world history, the, the British Industrial Revolution had been such a boon to its economy, and now the United States, its innovation is starting to lead the way. We have uh, John Finch in 1787 with the steamboat, Eli Whitney, 1793 with the cotton gin, uh, 1793, uh, 1798, Eli Whitney, um, it's a jig for uh, guiding tools, facilitate the manufacture of interchangeable parts. This is all going to lead toward the automation process at Henry Ford. In 1802, Oliver Evans, the steam engine. Uh, 1813, uh, Richard Chitterworth, the cast iron plow. Um, 1830, Peter Cooper, railroad locomotive, first steam locomotive built in America, Peter Cooper. 1831, the one I, just, I mentioned earlier, uh, Cyrus McCormick's Reaper. Uh, me mechanized harvesting early model could cut six acres of grain a day. Uh, 1836, Samuel Colt, the revolver, first successful repeating pistol. Also one of the early things that had interchangeable parts leading to auto early automation. A little later than this, but we're getting there. 1837, John Deere steel plow, I just mentioned that. Steel surface kept soil from sticking. Farming thus made easier on rich prairies of Midwest. Uh, George, or excuse me, Charles, Goodyear, 1839, uh, the vulcanization of rubber made rubber um, much more useful for preventing it from sticking and uh, melting to hot in hot weather. So that's called the vulcanization of rubber, uh, Charles Goodyear, 1839. 1842, Crawford W. Long first ad, uh, administered ether in surgery, and I'll have a little e uh, um, excerpt for that in a second. Samuel B. Morris Telegraph, Samuel F. B. Morris Telegraph, uh, 1844. Uh, 1846, Elias Howe, sewing machine. Uh, 1846 uh, again, uh, Norbert Rilieu, the vacuum evaporator, improved the method of removing water from a sugar cane. And uh, let's see, George Pullman, uh, Pullman passenger car. First railroad sleeping car suitable for long distance travel, that's in 1859. William Ke Kelly was the air boiling process, which is an improved method of converting, uh, converting iron into steel, usually known as the Bessemer process. Um, talked about this a lot in our U.S. history course this year for NUA. And I just want to go back to the medical science issue. This is out of um, Brinkley's Unfinished Nation, just another um, topic that uh, the um, America past and present doesn't address uh, 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 in any uh, in-depth manner. So I'm just going to read the passage here that I think you'll find interesting. In the age of rapid technological and scientific advances, medicine sometimes see that seemed to lag behind. In part, that was because the character of the medical profession, which in the absence of any significant regulation, attracted many poor, poorly educated people and many quacks. We've heard of snake oils and such. Um, so, efforts to regulate the profession were beaten back in the 1830s and 40s by those who considered the licensing of physicians to be undemocratic and monopolistic. <coughs> the prestige of the professions therefore remained low, so people didn't trust medical doctors. The biggest problem facing American medicine, however, was the absence of, the basic, of basic knowledge about disease. The great medical achievement of the 18th century, the development of the vaccination against smallpox by Edward Jenner, came from uh, no broad theory of infection, but from brilliant adaptation of folk practices. And then you have William Morton's use of uh, anesthetics. Um, John Warren, a Boston surgeon, soon began using these uh, uh, anesthetics to um, put his patients under. And in the absence of any broad except scientific methods and experimental practice in medicine, it was very difficult for even the most talented doctors to make progress. So just wanted to take a note on that. Thank you for reviewing this information, and good luck on your quizzes, exams, discussions, and assignments.